Hey, welcome back to Growing in the Gospel. I'm Pastor Kerry, and I am excited that we are starting a new study with this video. It's called Family Matters, Eight Habits of Happy Homes, and this is part one. So you've tuned into a long-form teaching series aimed at the family, the Christian home, or the church family. Whatever construct your home or your situation, I want you to join me in Psalm chapter 90, there are eight habits we're going to talk about. I might even grow that list by one or two. And we're going to start today in Psalm 90, a Psalm of Moses, and we're going to discover habit number one. So join me there. Get your hearts ready. Thanks for joining me for this journey. This is the first part in a multi-part series. I hope that you will be strengthened, whatever the structure of your home situation. Now, what you're going to see in the next few minutes is a quick introductory thought regarding this series and how we are approaching this series uh, contextually and um, and how I want you to receive it looking forward, not backward. Now, backward look can help us with what to learn from, but it's also usually filled with regrets and things we wish we could undo. So Paul said, forgetting those things which are behind, I'm pressing toward the mark. I'm looking forward. I'm reaching forward. So My goal is not to shame you with your regrets. My goal is that from this day forward, you would start establishing good habits, good patterns in your family life. So we're going to talk about that for just a second, and then we're going to segue to the entire message presented to the Emmanuel family a week prior to today when I'm airing this video. And so I hope it will bless you. Let's dive into habit number one of Family Matters, Eight Habits of Happy Homes. The series is... is called Family Matters, Eight Habits of Happy Homes. And I realize as I start a series like this, I'm talking to a church family of many kinds of families. There are some with the kinds of scars and bruises and regrets that the minute the pastor announces he's gonna do a series on the family, they just don't even wanna come. A series like this could be used by Satan to just guilt and shame some part of your past. And I wanna kinda cut that off at the head. We're talking, I'm talking this morning to a church of every kind of family. There are many singles in our church that intend to marry, some are engaged. There are some singles that don't intend to marry. There are some widowed that don't intend to remarry. There are some divorced. There are some remarried. There are some traditional families and some blended families, and some single parent families, and some adoptive or foster families, and there are some empty nests. And I might insert here, I thank God for that diversity of families. Not that mistakes and regrets and brokenness has happened, I wouldn't wish that on anybody, but I thank God that the gospel reaches all of us from our past. And any healthy church should have all of those kinds of families gathering. Any, any healthy church, and especially in 2021. I mean, the percentage of brokenness in American families is, it's everywhere. So, the principles we will study will equip you for your particular journey. I'm not aiming at a one size fits all, and if you don't fit into this little box, of a traditional family, then, then, then you're outside or you're excluded. No, whatever your family context right now, there's a path forward in the principles of God, in the grace of God, in the mercy of God. And so I promise you there will be something that will equip you for your journey. Strengthening homes where people live, that's the goal of the series. Not guilt, not shame, not regret. I will necessarily be aiming at uplifting God's ideal. But I want to confess to you, I don't live up to God's ideal, neither do any of us. And so please don't take when I'm aiming at God's ideal as a stick that I'm beating you over the head with regarding your situation or your past. The idea here is learn from the past and then turn around and press forward, forgetting those things which are behind, Paul said. The backward look is only to learn The forward look is to chart the right course, starting today, moving forward. And so every single one of these principles applies to us personally. It applies to the nucleus of our family home. 
and it applies broadly to our church family. And uh, so I hope you'll receive it that way and uh, look forward and ask God to shape you going forward. Uh, I told you it was for fun, okay? Don't send me an email, all right. Um, but how many of you, your show, that was, one of those was your show, way back. I heard a few of you go, that's my show. We were driving not long ago in the car and Chad and Charlie were in the back seat and, and Chad just started humming a song. I said, I know what you've been watching. Um, so yeah, those bring back a lot of good nostalgic memories and moments of humor. I listened to a interview yesterday with Mike Rowe. Mike was the host of a show called Dirty Jobs. Uh, many of you might recognize that name from that show. He was uh, interviewed on Daily Wire, and in a part of the conversation, they were talking about the confusion in our modern culture, the fact that there are thousands and thousands of podcasts and books and potential solutions for every possible challenge or struggle or problem and, and every possible angle of approach to all those things, but there's no authority. There's no objective reality or truth. It's really just your opinion against my opinion against someone else's opinion, and our culture has basically said, there is no real truth. It's just your truth and my truth, which is very convenient because if I disagree with you, I go, well, that's your truth. It's not true for me. The problem with that approach to life is that it has, as Mike was talking about, it sows chaos and confusion. Every man does that which is right in his own eyes. And he said this in the interview, and I quote, have you ever gone to a museum and not really known which direction to take or what you were really even looking at? What you need in that moment is a docent or a guide. We have, he says, we have at our disposal now, for the first time in history, 98% of all of the known information in the history of the world, and it's right here on your device. But we lack a compass. We're like Magellan with no sense of direction out in the middle of the North Atlantic with no sextant, no star. And we're all trying to dead reckon in the middle of a rough, tempestuous sea, and it's scary. And so, yeah, we look for stars. We look for harbingers or signs. We look for guides. I thought that was a very poignant quote from, as far as I know, a man who's maybe not even a believer in Jesus, but acknowledging from a secular viewpoint, our culture is lost at sea and we have eradicated all of the points that point to the star, the north. All, all fixed positions are lost. And we're out in the middle of this rough, tempestuous sea trying to find our way looking every direction, and there's a million guides or maybe more than a million guides and opportunities, people that want our attention, people that want to sell us solutions. But let's face it, every single one of us in this room, regardless of your family context or the dynamics of your home, you identify with that statement. It's scary. It's a rough, tempestuous sea, and it's scary. So today, I really want to talk about learning from the designer. I want to press into the principle that God is the author of the home. He created a ecosystem or a microcosm of something far greater. And he wants to be our teacher. The, each of these messages will have a title, but then a principle. Habit number one, we follow Jesus and grow in the gospel together. The takeaway today, my goal for you today, is that you would say as a family, whatever your family situation, we follow Jesus. And I don't mean ethereal, non-committal, you know, your own version of Jesus. I mean the Jesus of Scripture, as he identified himself and the teachings that he gave. Letting him be the authority, letting him be true north, letting him be the fixed position of truth, and doing our flawed best to align our lives with him as the designer of the home. 
following him, growing in the gospel. Think about the verses I put in your outline to begin with, that picture that reveal God as a teacher. Satan is so aggressive to try to diminish and downsize our view of God. But God in his own self-revelation, before he, well, I don't wanna go down that road. Let's just tell, let me just tell you this, as I've said throughout our study of Revelation, he has revealed himself in numerous ways, but the predominant ways he reveals himself are in saving grace and mercy and gentle, fatherly, shepherdly love. He has revealed himself as a teacher and a guide and a savior. Yeah, king, yeah, final authority, yeah, in the end position, judge. But he wants to step into your story and be the guide. Deuteronomy 4, now therefore hearken, O Israel, unto the statutes and the judgments which I teach you, for to do them that you may live. Look at the formula there. God says, listen, what a privilege it is to be taught by the creator of the universe, how he created life to work, then to take that teaching and to do it, and as a result, we live. Life grows up within us. Psalm 24, the prayer of the psalmist, show me thy ways, O Lord, teach me thy paths. Lead me in thy truth and teach me. Hey, can you pray that sincerely? Uh, I'm glad you're here today. I'm thankful for all the stories that God has written, but how about tomorrow and Tuesday and Wednesday when you're up against challenges and struggles and when things are tense in your family situation or in your life situation, do you pause and say, hold hold on God, before I go to the podcast and the self-help books and the seminars and the classes or the therapists, I'm gonna look up. God, I want you to teach me. Show me your way. He wants to. Psalm 25, 12, what is the man that, I'm sorry, eight and nine, good and right, good and upright is the Lord, therefore he will teach sinners in the way. The meek, the teachable, the hungry, the humble, will he guide in judgment, and the meek will he teach his way. Verse 12, what man is he that fears the Lord? Him shall he teach in the way that he shall choose. God, you choose the way and you teach me. Psalm 27, 11, teach me thy way, O Lord. Lead me in a plain path because of mine enemies. Read the next one, Psalm 32, 8. Lift up your voice. Read it out loud with me. This is my life verse, though I have about 100 favorites. Here we go. I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eye. There's no better way to do life, to do family, to do home than to say, God, I want you to instruct me I'm your child, you're the true father. I'm your child, teach me, guide me. Psalm 86, teach me thy way, O Lord, I will walk in thy truth. And Psalm 143, teach me to do thy will, for thou art my God, thy spirit is good. Lead me into the land of uprightness. So to begin with today, listen, you don't have to be alone in your family journey. That's the whole context of this study today is that God wants to get into this with you and walk you through it and teach you through it. You don't have to raise your hand because I know the answer. Every single person in this room at one time or another has felt underwater and way in over your head in family matters. Every single person. There, there is an ideal, there is a utopia, there is a perfect ideal, but it doesn't any longer exist on planet Earth, okay? And so we all, all aspire to it, but everybody is broken and everybody feels the weight of the scary aspects. Everybody feels the weight of the pressure of, I don't know what to do right now. I don't know what to do for my marriage. I don't know what to do for my kids. I don't know how to repair these relationships. I don't know how to repair some of the damage of the past. And I wanna shout into your moment, God does. He's a good teacher. He will guide you. He will give you access to his wisdom. He's a great teacher but he only teaches the teachable. Are you teachable? Well, I know, I listened to that podcast and this book and I read this and I, don't you know? Listen, are are you willing to let all that fall away before the instructions of God? Because he is true north. And all the other things may be helpful. May not, they may be, they may not be. Many of them are not. But God will never fail you. And, and, and let me tell you something. There's nothing supernatural about listening to a podcast. 
But the moment you pray and ask for God's help, you have just brought the supernatural factor to bear in your struggle. The hand of God, the presence of God, the active work of God is now being brought to bear in your situation. And he can move mountains that a million podcasts and a million seminars on marriage and parenting can never move. So God as teacher, and the reason I chose Psalm 90 today to fly through is that this is a psalm written by Moses. It's the only psalm written by Moses. It's one of my favorite chapters in all of the Bible. It, it was probably the, only, uh, the oldest psalm on record. It's the only psalm with Moses' name attached. And what is Moses doing in the psalm? He's teaching a family. He's actually teaching a family of families. So if you remember quickly the context of Moses' story, he was born as a Hebrew slave, quickly adopted by providential circumstances into the household of Pharaoh, grew up with a pretty intense identity crisis. Am I a slave Hebrew or am I Egyptian? Am I a slave or royalty? And this conflict of identities, much like a modern child would grow up in a broken home or with a absent father or whatever, wondering who am I, where am I, how do I get my bearings here? Moses would have had a hard time in life getting his bearings. At 40, he committed a crime. He's now a fugitive of justice. He goes to flee to the desert to become a shepherd, um, starts his life all over, gets a wife, has a couple boys, and 40 years go by, and then God says, go back to Egypt, and Moses, Moses says, no. And he says, go back to Egypt, he says, no. And God says, go back to Egypt, and Moses says, okay. And a lot of detail happens here. God uses Moses to bring about some supernatural events in Egypt by which he is extending mercy to the Egyptians, and a, a chance to choose the true God and forsake their false gods, and by which he is freeing the family of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob that has now multiplied into more than a million people, and they're a family of families enslaved. So Moses at 80 years old finds himself the unwilling de facto leader of a million people leaving Egypt to go to the desert, they get to the border of the promised land, they rebel against God, the game changes, now they're gonna spend 40 more years in the desert wandering. Moses is now 120, and somewhere towards the end of his life, he writes this psalm. He's instructing the generation that has survived. Remember this, a generation has passed away, they weren't permitted to go into the promised land. For 40 years, they wandered the desert, poking holes and burying people. Everybody over 20 has passed away. Moses and, and Joshua and Caleb are the last remaining survivors of their generation. Everybody else is at least 20 years younger than them uh, and was 20 and under at the rebellion. Now they've grown up and they're the next generation that's going to enter the promised land and Moses is writing, like he writes Deuteronomy to instruct this generation, he writes Psalm 90 as like a field guide for life. It's, it's a short psalm that teaches you everything you need to know about life and what it's all about. So we're gonna fly through it and lift off some applications for our homes. Number one, you guys okay? You with me? Okay. God is our forever home. God is our forever home. There it is. Family is God's ecosystem for knowing him and learning life. Now get this, look at verse one. Lord, it's a prayer. Thou hast been our dwelling place. You can, you can superimpose on dwelling place the word home. It's exactly what it means. It's intimate, it's personal, it's up close, it's safe, it's secure. It's the only home Moses ever really knew. Everything I just told you. He was pretty much bouncing from home to home his whole life and transient all of his life. He never really had a home and he never really until his death, ever got home. But you know what he found out along the way? Hey God, you're, you're truly my home. And not just mine only, you're our home in, what's the last two words of verse one? Shout them out with me. All, come on, do it again. All, so from the very get go, this psalm is aimed at families. It's aimed at the generational transfer of who is it all about, what's it all about, and what is the true definition of home. And so we begin with this, God is really our forever home. 
which makes your right now home temporary, transitional. You're going somewhere, it's going somewhere, and your home right now is a small picture of a greater reality. These kids don't belong to you, they belong to God. It is your responsibility to not dial them in to you only, but to your father, the true father, the true shepherd of your home, and the true ultimate destination of everyone that will trust in him. And so the family, very truthfully, it is God's ecosystem, it's God's incubator where new lives and young lives and all of the lives growing together in that ecosystem are knowing God through their experience and observation of what happens in this home and learning life based on the boundaries and the words of God. Look at verse two. Before the mountains were brought forth or ever thou hadst formed the earth or the world, read the rest of the verse with me, go. Even from everlasting to everlasting thou art God. God, we're starting with you. We're building on the rock, a foundation. Why? Because our story is short. We're gonna see that next. But your story is everlasting eternity past to everlasting eternity future. So God, we are gonna anchor ourselves to you as our true home. You are our true north. Number two, life is a long, short pilgrimage home. It's a long, short pilgrimage home and family is God's gift of companionship for the journey. Now everybody loves verses one and two of Psalm 90, but nobody loves verses three to 11. So the next two points I'm gonna tell you, it's hard news, but it's news we need to know. It's news that needs to shape how we go at this thing called a family. And so many times we're just rolling forward, passing time, and we're not really intentional. We're not really deliberate. We don't really step back and take a survey of why did I get married? And why did I start a family? Why do I want a family? Why do, I, why do we have kids? So many times it started as a selfish pursuit. I'm looking for things that will make me happy. And now we're finding out along the journey, wait a minute, God has a totally different purpose for the family. It's not that he's averse to your happiness. It's just that's not his primary objective. It is a foregone conclusion. You're gonna end up happy if you follow him. Yes, it's, it's joy and gladness we're gonna get to that. But there's a whole different view that God wants us to have on what is this thing called a family or a home? And where are we at on the journey? So look at verse three. Thou turnest man to destruction. This happened at the fall. Sin entered the human race and death by sin, and death passed upon all men because all have sinned, Scripture says. But then look at what God says, return ye children of men. There's a little word play here, Hebrew poetry is like that. On one hand, to an unrepentant heart, an unbelieving heart, he's saying return to destruction, return to what sin deserves. But on the other hand, he's also saying return back to me and my ways. There's a path, yeah, you've fallen into sin, but there's a path back. It's a hint at the gospel. Verse four, now Moses, the next few verses, is going to talk about the brevity of life. He's gonna press deeply into this idea that it seems like a long journey, but it's really a short journey. So let's read it. For a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday, like a day. A thousand years is like a day, it just flies by when it is past. And as a watch in the night, that's three hours. Thou carriest them away as with a flood. He's referring to the generation that I just talked about that has passed away over over the last 40 years. All of his generation are gone now. It's like a flash flood that swept through the camp and they're all gone. They are as asleep. I don't know how your kids talked when they were little. Uh, A lot of kids don't know how to frame the passing of time and so they'll say, how many sleeps until my birthday? How many sleeps until Christmas? Our son Larry, it was, he coined his own term, bed nights. How many bed nights till my birthday? How many bed nights till we go to vacation? And Moses is saying, an entire lifetime is like a sleep. It's like one night passing. And you wake up and it's like, did it even happen? And those of you that are older in the room, you're feeling this. Those of you that are younger in the room, like, shut up, pastor, I don't like this part. I told you, nobody likes this part. But the, the fact remains, again, it, it, it does, truth is not emotional. God is telling us what we need to know 
regardless of how we feel about it. And he says, yeah, it is a short journey. It's like grass that grows up in the morning, it's flourishing, and by the evening it's scorched and it's being cut down and withered. So here's my point, friends. We have one shot and it's brief. Wherever you are on the journey, your present struggle is this moment and it does not define your whole journey. It will not define your whole journey. In Christ, if you have Jesus, the great teacher on your side, he is walking you through every struggle, every hardship, every difficult time. I can only speak to 35 years of it, but I can tell you if you're married to a struggling, broken husband, he can grow in God's grace, but you need to give him at least a few decades because he is married to a broken, struggling wife, and you need at least a decade. You're probably a faster learner than your husband. Dana's much faster learner than I am. Um, I'm pretty hard-headed. I get pretty self-defensive. I just wanna press into you that no, this moment does not define the whole journey. You have, barring the rapture, you have Prayerfully, a lot of time ahead of you, a lot of road ahead of you, you are on a short pilgrimage that feels long. And I know, I'm, I don't know who, but I'm talking to somebody right now that you're in the grip of some deep, dark family struggle and you don't know, you can't see any way out, you're ready to give up, you don't think there's a way out. Um, and I just wanna tell you, don't give up. Humble yourself, fall before God, ask for his mercy and his grace, ask him to teach you, and he will. God grows us on this pilgrimage home, and what you need is companionship, a church family of companions, a family of companions. It's gonna go by so, so fast. It's short, you get one shot, there's no hacks. There's no way to hack the system or to shortcut the system. It's a long, hard, growing journey. Our family, years ago, we were going on vacation and we would go to the Southern California desert for vacation because we could get places to stay for 50 bucks a night. Nobody wanted to go to Palm Desert in July because it's 115 degrees, so we went um, <laughs> because it was affordable. And Dana and I, our boys were in upper elementary. Haley was probably just prior to pre, you know, school, prior to pre-K maybe. And Dana and I, we always try to make vacation special, even though we didn't always have a lot of money to do a nice vacation. We always guarded our vacation time, always did something meaningful. And that year was when Nintendo came out with this game system called the Wii. You guys know what I'm talking about? Okay. So we decided to surprise the kids, and for vacation, we bought a Wii. And we wrapped it up and we brought it on vacation. And first night of vacation, we kind of, we, we pull out of our driveway. We always play Toy Story, You Got a Friend in Me, always. That was the ver first way th thing we did on vacation, You Got a Friend in Me. And then we got to the desert, we laid out some of the things we were gonna do and we had them open this Wii. And if you remember, you strap the controller to your wrist and you're, it's a very active, interactive thing that you're in engaging with the TV. And we had a blast that vacation. We laughed and we played bowling and golf and tennis and every other thing on the Wii. And we stayed inside in, in the air conditioning most of the time. It was awesome. <laughs> Larry figured out something, my middle son figured out something on the Wii. I probably should say, during this series, I'm suspending the $50 fee for family stories, just, just to go on record. Um, anyway, I, uh, Larry figured out how to, how to do a hack on the Wii that I never knew about. So they created their own little characters. You do that, these little icons that represent you. They made one for me. Didn't look a thing like me, but they all thought it did. Um, and then they had their own characters. And then you can set, there's individual settings for your character that you can set the skill level as opposed to other characters. I never knew this. And it makes a lot of things make sense. Because from early on with that Wii system, here's what Larry did. He took his player and set it to the easiest settings so that if you're playing baseball, everything's a home run. If you're playing, it's like for a three-year-old. If you're bowling, everything's a strike. If you're hitting tennis, if the TV's there, you could go, boom, and it, and it would go back over the net. You'd, it just, 
the, the controller was irrelevant. No matter what you did, the game did the right thing. It made Larry like the Marvel superpower hero of the Wii. He could do no wrong. But then he took my character and he turned the skill level all the way up as though I am like a Guinness World Record Wii player and the game is now gonna make my game hard, as hard as it possibly can and his game as easy as it, so I'm playing this 10 year old in Wii and everything I, every time I hit the ball, it's out of bounds. Every time I swing, it's a strike. Every time I bowl, it's a gutter ball. And then Larry, home run, strike. I mean, and he's just looking at me laughing like, you're such a loser. Do you know like 20 years went by? And I'm playing Chad, my grandson, and he's crushing me in every game. And he's laughing at me like, Papa, you stink. And that's when I found out that my character was set against me. Listen, you can hack we. The world tries to tell you you can hack life, you can hack family, there's an easy way, there's a shortcut, there's a trick or a trend that's gonna change everything. There isn't, there isn't. God is a good teacher. This is a long, short pilgrimage. It's hard, it's not for the faint of heart. So buckle up for a rough ride, but let's keep reading. Number three, it gets worse before it gets better, hang in there. Number three, every home is troubled by sin and struggle. This is why it's hard. Every home is troubled by sin and struggle, and family is God's microcosm of the gospel of grace. Look at verse seven. Verse seven, now he's gonna talk about sin. In Old Testament terms, he's gonna explain how that our sin condemns us guilty and flawed and broken before God, and really under his wrath and judgment. We've spent so much time talking about wrath and judgment and understanding the principles of justice in scripture. So Moses says, we are consumed by your anger and your wrath, we are troubled. You've set our iniquities before thee, our secret sins in the light of thy countenance. For all our days are passed away in thy wrath. We spend our years as a tale that is told. He comes back now to the brevity of life. The days of our years are three score and 10, that's 70, or if by reason of strength they may four score, that's 80. Yet is there strength and labor and sorrow. He's saying even the best life and the longest life is still gonna be full of labor and hardship and sorrow. And then it's soon gonna be cut off and we fly away. Who knows the power of thine anger, even according to thy fear, so is thy wrath. That all sounds pretty dark, but hang on, hang on. What is he teaching these families in this ancient place? He's teaching them that they have violated God's laws. He's teaching them that because of their sin, they're separated from God. Frankly, all of Psalm 90 unfolds the principles of the gospel. And from ancient times to present day, the principles of the gospel are designed to be the operative principles every day at work and in practice in your family. Why? I'm gonna show you. But but hang with me, this is critical to everything else that's going on in your life. Let's talk about for a minute the principles of the gospel. I'm gonna put them up on the screen. There's different ways to say them, but they all say the same thing. I think I chose 10 words here, and they go in succession. So let's break this down. Just trying to understand our journey with God. Our journey with God begins with, he is holy. That means he's perfect, he's without sin. That means he has an ideal, a perfect standard for his image bearers and for the family, the home, as a reality that he designed, as his institution. But guess what happened to God's creation? That creation rebelled against God and fell into sin. How many of us are sinners in the room? All of us, all of us. And so let me just insert here. There are broken families and then there are broken families. Pastor, what kind of family, what kind of families are there? broken families. No, no, but, but what other kinds of families are there? They're all broken. They're broken in different ways and to different degrees. 
Maybe you have married and stayed married, and you say, well, we don't have a broken home. Yeah, you do. It's just broken in less visible ways. You're just struggling with sin in different ways and on different levels. We're all broken before God. That's the second principle of the gospel. And that brokenness requires justice, which requires death. Now, we spend a lot of time talking about that. That's because God is good. Eternal judgment exists because God is good and he has promised to deal with evil. But the question of the Bible is, wait a minute, is if God loves me, and if he has to judge me because of my sin, how does that mix? How does that reconcile? Is God gonna judge me, or is he going to love me be, and forgive me? Which is it? Well, justice requires judgment and death, so the natural question is, is there a way to have mercy? Is there a way to have forgiveness and to experience grace? Is there a way past my sin so that I can come back into relationship with God? And God's loud answer all throughout Scripture is, yes, I'm a God of mercy. My mercy endures forever. My mercy endures forever. How long does his mercy endure? Can you ever exhaust it? Do you understand? God, yes, he's a God of judgment if you force him to be a judge. But long before that, he wants to be a God of mercy and grace. And what is that, by what means, by what way can God provide a just kind of mercy? Here's my point. What does God do with my sin? If he's merciful, he's gotta be justly mercy. He's gotta, he, he can't just pretend I didn't sin. He can't just wink and close his eyes towards it. He can't ignore it, because it's still a thing. It has to be resolved, and so the resolution of my sin, the resolution of justice was atonement. What is atonement? It's payment. It's the penalty or the judgment being meted out like a courtroom, justice being done. And who provided the atonement? Say it out loud. Jesus. Jesus stepped in and said, I'll show mercy and grace by taking, absorbing your hurt, your offense, your sin, your law breaking. I will go to the cross and suffer for it. I'll bear the judgment so you can be loved and forgiven. And through Jesus, the door is open to the next word. What's the next word? Repentance. Now that's a very misunderstood word. And some people don't even like this word. This is a great word. This word is the gift of God and grace of God to you opening a door to come back from your struggle. Repentance is the act of accepting God's judicial ruling on my guilt or my behavior, and it is the receiving of God's atonement through Jesus through faith and through belief. Repentance is, God, I get it, I'm guilty and I'm wrong, can you forgive me on the basis of Jesus? And God always answers that prayer with yes. Not on the basis of your goodness, but on the basis of Jesus' goodness. Hang on, this applies to every day of your family life. So now because of repentance, I can enjoy reconciliation. My separated relationship with God is now brought back together and I am called his child and I am renewed, renewed, renewal of joy. Guilt is absolved, the relationship is restored. I am secured and loved unconditionally and I can go forward in his grace. Now. Those words need to frame every single operative day in your home. Why? Because every day in your home, people sin against each other. And the offender, the only way back is not to blame shift and defend and argue and debate who was more wrong. The only way back is not to win a fight. I've won a lot of fights, but I've lost a lot more in the process. Listen, when it comes to family, there's not a person in this room, I promise you, that is more self-defensive than me. When I'm wrong, I wanna blame everybody else. And I always make the situation worse, why? Because I am stepping out of the bounds of the gospel. I repented before Jesus to be saved, and he saved me and forgive me, but now I'm wrong in my family life and I don't wanna repent. I don't wanna swallow my pride. I'd rather win the fight and make it everybody else's fault. And I can tell you, as long as I was unrepentant in my family life, in my marriage, with my kids, as long as I was staunchly unrepentant, I was breaking my home even worse. 
The breakthrough moments have not been when I finally got everybody lined up and on course and doing what they're supposed to do. The, the breakthrough moment was not when I fixed everybody else. The breakthrough moments was when I looked in the mirror and realized I'm the problem. And I said, God, have mercy on me. I am breaking my marriage. I am breaking my kids. I am breaking my home. And I don't want to. But I'm, I'm torn between the love I've received that I don't know how to give. And then I many times had to go to my wife and go to my kids. And it goes both ways, I might add. The only reason I'm standing here before you today is because my wife and kids were really good forgivers. Really good forgivers. And for every 10 times they forgave me, there's at least one or two I had to forgive them too. So it goes both ways. But repentance is the moment that the offender accepts the guilt and says, you know what, I'm wrong. And now the ice is broken. Now the pride is sucked out of the room. And now the Spirit of God is unquenched to flow freely because it's only a humbled heart, a repentant heart that has access to all the supernatural resources of salvation and redemption in the gospel. So the idea is in the home, we fail God's holy standard every day. We sin against each other, but justice and death was done for all of that on the cross, and we need God's mercy and grace as a family. I need it as a parent and and a spouse as much as anybody else in my home needs it, and we call on that atonement through the work of Jesus, and because of that condition of we live in the ecosystem of God's securing love, I am safe now to repent. I'm safe to own my failure. I'm safe to say to my kids, hey, kids, I blew, wait, I blew it. I'm wrong. I'm so sorry I said that. I'm so sorry I lost my temper. I'm so sorry. Hey, you heard me say that to your mom. Guys, I'm so sorry. Does that flow in your home? If not, let me tell you what you're doing. You're just heaping it all up in a big pile of manure, leaving it unresolved and it will just follow you. You'll be dragging a, an 18 foot trailer of manure of unresolved offenses in your family life. When you have the open door of the lavish grace of the gospel, you could, the, your best witness to your kids is not your lectures and your preaching to them the gospel. Well, we're supposed to love Jesus and accept him and trust him as for forgiveness. Now shut up and go to your room you little blankety blank. Do you understand? You are totally dismantling the gospel in that moment. You have dismantled it, you have destroyed it. Your kids will grow up and despise the Jesus you say you love. Unless you come back to that moment, you go to that room, you sit down with that kid with a broken heart and you say, I should not have said that. I should not have called you that. I'm so sorry. I'm sinful too, I'm broken too. Will you forgive me like Jesus has forgiven me? Now you're teaching the gospel. Now you're showing your children a father that's better than you. It's hard to do that, but it is so liberating because it reconciles the relationship and it brings renewal and life to the home. The Jesus journey is one of growing forward slowly, failing regularly, repenting repeatedly and quickly, appropriating forgiveness perpetually, renewing love daily, growing close consistently, and repeating the process a million times over. Did you hear it? I'm gonna say it again. We're almost done. The Jesus journey is one of growing forward slowly, failing regularly, repenting repeatedly and quickly, appropriating forgiveness. Christ has forgiven me, I forgive you. Perpetually forgiving, renewing love every day and growing close consistently and repeating the process over and over. And you know what? Anybody can break it. 
The offender can say, I'm not repentant. I'm not the problem you are. It was your fault. You're the reason I lost my temper. You're the reason I did that. Keep blaming everybody else and all you're doing is slamming the door of reconciliation shut. So the offender can block the flow of the gospel in the home by not repenting, by playing the pride and self-defense. But the offended, the offended, and at one point or another, you're gonna be the offender, and at one point or another, you're gonna be the offended. Tomorrow, probably this afternoon. (laughs) Probably on the way home. (laughs) The offender cannot repent. The offended can refuse forgiveness. And what you're saying is, no, I don't forgive you. I, I want you to pay. That hurt, and I'm not gonna forgive you. You're gonna pay. Either way, the hardness of heart is what keeps the family from coming back together with reconciliation and the peace of God and the love of God. Number four, quickly, Jesus is the master teacher and the family is his classroom for building devoted disciples. You see, verses 12 to 17 are the principled, like rapid fire, machine gun fire applications of everything that Moses has set up. And so let me walk you through it really quick. First he says, so teach us. We've talked about that. We need him to teach us. And and thank God that's what we're doing right here today. We're sitting at the feet of Jesus, his word is speaking. Next we see number our days. Teach us to number our days. And the principle there is, the operative principle is every day matters. Every day is a war unto itself. It's a battle unto itself. Every day can be seized and redeemed and every day matters. So hang with me, number our days. Next, apply our hearts. Lord, she's, she's, she's wanting the picnic and the slide. This guy's, she's saying, this guy is preaching too long. Hey, hey we're a family. <laughs> Families, kids cry sometimes. So let's roll with it. And please let her know, don't be worried about it, okay? It just, I I addressed it because everyone's, all of us are thinking about it. Okay, look back at 12. I get one minute back. Here we go. (laughs) Teach us, Lord, to number our days. Every day matters and it's gonna go by quick. We need to apply our hearts to your wisdom. We wanna be teachable, your wisdom, and we're gonna have a whole message on that. Verse 13, return, O Lord, how long, and let it repent thee concerning thy servants. I don't have time to unfold that like I'd like to, but in this, the sense is, Moses is saying, God, could you turn back towards us in compassion and pity? It's a gospel prayer, but it's also an everyday prayer. God, I need your mercy right now. I need your grace operative in my life. And I understand, I, I gotta insert this. There have been probably a dozen times or more in our marriage where Dana and I were at a standstill She didn't understand me, I didn't understand her, and of course, she was wrong and I was right. (laughs) But you ever have those moments where you talk yourself till you're done? You argue and fuss yourself until you're done, and you just don't have anything else to say because you don't know where to go, you're in a spin cycle. And I'll tell you, most of those times I have been not clear-minded enough to do this, and I wish I could go back, but some of those times, God brought these kinds of admonitions to my mind, and I grabbed Dana's hand lovingly and said, follow me, and, and she's like, where are we going? I said, we're going in here to the couch. She said, what are we doing? And I got down on my knees. I said, come down here on, my, on your knees and let's pray. And she's like, what are we doing? I said, we're gonna pray, because I don't know what else to do. And literally pray, praying out of like exasperation with a bad attitude. And what I wanna pray is, Lord, fix this woman, you know, and she wants to pray, Lord, fix this human being, this man, this broken man. But that's, that's not a repentant prayer. A repentant prayer is, and this is something of what I prayed, and I'm, I don't know exactly, but it would have been something like this with frustration and tears. Lord, we, we don't know what to do, but we have you, and, and we need you to teach us what to do. Lord, I don't know how to be what she needs, and, and so God, I, 
I don't even know what to pray. I'm telling you. And I'm sitting there at the couch, and the devil's going, this is doing nothing. Because it's not sensory. It's not experiential. It's not emotional. But I can tell you within 10 minutes of those prayers, the whole conversation changed. And 35 years later, we're still here. And I'm not dead yet. <laughs> uh, Anyway, I, I want to tell more jokes, but I, I got to move on. Okay. <laughs> Apply our hearts. Return, O Lord. Satisfy us early with thy mercy. God, we need mercy in this situation. We need mercy operative in this situation. We need mercy for each other. Make us glad. Give us joy. And make us glad all our days. This is what puts gladness in your home. This is what puts joy in your heart. Resolved relationships, forgiveness, mercy, reconciliation. It's sweet. Verse uh, 15 swings the pendulum of hurt all the way into the positive. Make us glad according to the days wherein thou hast afflicted us. It's like oh, swallow up the negative with positive. Verse 17, let thy work, I'm sorry, 16, let thy work appear unto thy servants. Very important principle. God, you're working in us. You're using our family in your work. So show us that work. Show us the purpose of our family, that we're engaged in your work, and this is why Satan fights it so hard. Show us your work. Look at this phrase. Let the glory, I'm sorry, um, and thy glory, do you see it? And thy glory unto their children. When you live out the gospel in your home, here's what you're doing. Kids, I'm sinful and broken but he is awesome. His glory reflects out of your failures. Isn't that amazing? Out of your repentance, you radiate his gentle love and his mercy. And, and all of a sudden, your kids begin to separate broken dad from real dad. Broken mom from real dad. <laughs> broken home from forever home. And all of a sudden, you begin to reflect. And look at what he says in verse 17. Let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us. Do you know what he's praying in verse 17? I want to properly reflect who you are, God. Why? You cannot legislate for your children to believe or follow God. Your rules won't get them there. But your repentance and your reflection of his glory will. You can make Jesus completely unattractive, and they'll run from him. Or you can reveal him to be attractive in grace and mercy, and they will run to him. Let the beauty of the Lord God be upon us, and final phrase, and establish thou the work of our hands. Yea, the work of our hands, establish thou it. Lord, make us durable, give us an enduring strength in this journey called family. So look at the principles, and I'm done. I'm gonna, I got one little final closing thing, but look at the principles again. God is our forever home. Number two, life is a long, short pilgrimage home. Number three, every home is troubled by sin and struggle. Number four, Jesus is the master teacher, and the gospel is the operative reality. So when we we're relocating to Connecticut 12 years ago, and I'm not gonna share a lot of that story. Many of you have heard it too many times. But there was a sequence of events that I need to share with you very quickly that I'll never forget. We were really displaced. We were emotionally distraught, our whole family, me especially. Dana was probably the more predictable, durable one. I was still kind of recouping from cancer. I was afraid of pastoring. Um, and I j we were just totally disoriented. Our, our boys were away at college, so it was me and Dana and Haley. Haley was coming into junior high. Teenage years are tumultuous years. If you're a teenager, you're living right now some of the hardest years of your life, so hang in there. Hang in there. So I, I parented a lot out of fear. Maybe I'll talk about that another week. And I came home one day, and I'm, I'm, I'm worried about the church. I'm worried about the school. I don't see a way forward. I'm, I'm terrified in this new reality of our lives. We've lost a lot. I'm just living in fear and living on the edge. And our family life was combustible. You would not have seen that from the outside looking in. You could have guessed it. I mean, we're in total transition. But we were emotionally thin. And that shows up in your 
family life. You're picky at each other and you're easily offended. And, and I got home one afternoon and, and Haley was in the TV room watching TV and I was listening to what was on the TV and Dana was sort of the one that most vetted the shows that, that Haley was allowed to watch. We were very careful about media and music and all these influences. And, and so uh, again, saying I parented out of fear, I, I cried, I called out to the other room. I said, Haley, what are you watching in there? <laughs> and I, I said it about like that, really kind of a sparky tone because I'm afraid, you know, that, that Satan's gonna get my kids. And she goes, I'm watching Good Luck Charlie. And I said, did mom say it's okay? I don't know Good Luck Charlie. Did mom say it's okay? And I really suspect everything Disney, so it's like, you know, what are they programming with my daughter? And uh, I said, did mom say it's okay? She said, yeah, actually mom says, mom likes the show. In fact, dad, you should come watch it with me. You would like this show. And so something prompted me to go in and just crash on the couch. I was tired. I needed a minute to decompress anyway. So I sat on the couch. She started the show over. And long story short, over the next two years, I got addicted to good luck, Charlie. <laughs> and it became, you know, in a family that was really tense and emotional, and a season that was really emotional, it became a godsend, like a relief valve. And the premise of the show is that the older sister is a teenager, has a baby sister that's like two or three years old, and she's doing these video diary vlogs to her little sister about life, teaching her about life. And she, the end of the show every week is her little vlog to her sister, and she says, you know, good luck, Charlie. So the song to the show became so representative of what we were going through that when I was planning this series and I was talking to Lance and the team about the trailer that we were doing, I said, oh, we gotta use this song one week. And I pulled it up and I said, listen to these words. And I literally, Dana was laughing at me. I started crying halfway through the words of the song. You'll understand why in a minute. Because this speaks to your struggle too, probably. Today's all burnt toast, running late, and dad jokes. Has anybody seen my left shoe? Close my eyes, take a bite, grab a ride, laugh out loud. There it is up on the roof. I've been there, I survived, so just take my advice. And then the chorus says, hang in there, baby. Things are crazy, but I know your future's bright. Hang in there, baby. There's no maybe. Everything turns out all right. Sure, life is up and down, but trust me, it comes back around. You're gonna love who you turned out to be. Now, when I was reading that and I got choked up, I couldn't read it. Dana's laughing at me, Lance is laughing at me. I texted the song to Haley, who now lives in Nashville and she's married. And I wrote in the text, I just want you to know, I love who you turned out to be. And I wanna tell you from the heart of Jesus, in him, if Jesus is savior in your life, and if he is teacher in your home. Yeah, it's rough. It's a lot of ups and downs. But in the end, the future is sure. And in Christ, you're gonna love who you turn out to be. Let's pray together. Lord, I thank you for this time to study your word, Psalm 90. It's rich, it's powerful, it's life-shaping. And as families, we need to anchor our homes to these truths. We need to practice the principles of the gospel every day. We need to show our children, yes, we are sinful, but you are great and you are gracious. God, may your beauty and your glory reflect out from us and from our church. With our heads bowed and eyes closed, I want to ask you to spend a moment in response, in prayer to the word of God, right at your seat. Before we go, the operative word is repentance. The best thing you could do right now is repent of whatever is roadblocking your family relationships. 
And then maybe later today, there needs to be a longer conversation of humility. But the sweet outcome of that is that God is pleased, God is honored, Jesus becomes active, growth happens, and he turns what was bad into good. And this is what he does. As believers are praying, if you are a person that's never trusted Jesus as your savior, I just talked about the gospel. And the starting point with God is to receive his gift of salvation. So wherever you are in the room, if you've never trusted Jesus and you would like to, right now, right where you're seated, take a minute and pray from a sincere heart. Something like this, Jesus, I believe today and I want to choose you and I repent. I acknowledge I'm sinful and flawed and I believe you died. You're the only atonement for my sin. I believe you rose again and you live to give me new life. And right now I'm asking you to come into my life and save me. Now my friend, if you are making that decision today, sincerely, you're being brought into the family of God in this moment. And I wanna encourage you to go to the Next Step stations in the back, make a beeline as soon as we dismiss. We have a box back there that says, for your new walk with God. There's some resources, there's a Bible and another book and some other things we wanna put into your hands. No one's gonna hassle you. We wanna cheer you on. This is a great, great decision. So I'm gonna pray right now. We're gonna stand and sing and we're gonna go have a picnic. Lord, we love you. Bless these principles in our lives, put them to work. Change us because of them as only you can do. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you for joining me for part one of Family Matters, Eight Habits of Happy Homes. Today we've talked about learning from the designer, just this foundational idea that we are following Jesus together and growing in the gospel. And he is the teacher. He's the master teacher and the family's the ecosystem, the laboratory, the incubator of all the realities of the gospel lived out. And so the best way we teach the gospel is by living it out at home, demonstrating it. And this is just the first step in our series, and we will continue this next week. Thanks for joining me on Growing in the Gospel, and thanks for joining me for Family Matters. I hope that you'll invite some friends that you know that this series could bless to be a part. Maybe share this video with them so they can jump in on the ground level as we go over this the next eight or ten weeks. Thanks for joining me. I'm praying for you all. Have a great day. We'll see you tomorrow.